Welcome to the safety presentation. This is not necessarily a recapitulation of EHS guidelines, but it's a couple of big picture ideas that hopefully will, uh, will convince you or scare you or whatever we need to do to avoid uh, accidents. We've had not that many accidents, um, uh, and none of them have been uh, serious. Um, so we're doing pretty good on the safety, um, safety front, let's just keep it that way. So safety is really about mitigation of risk. You can never, when you go to jury duty, they'll say uh, you will never eliminate all doubt. Um, you'll never eliminate all risk. It's impossible to eliminate risk, just as it's impossible to eliminate leaks through graphene barriers. The goal is just to mitigate these things uh, and to give the oxygen atom the longest, most circuitous route possible before it makes it to your solar cell and degrades it. Uh, similarly, the um, sometimes reduce, reuse, recycle is sort of criticized because we kind of, when you throw a PET bottle in the recycling to the extent that it actually does find someone who wants to recycle it, which is now kind of a bit of a fraught issue, um, it doesn't really get recycled, it gets downcycled, particularly materials that can't be reprocessed easily, so they get ground up into mattress filling and stuff like that. Um, and, and we think, well, what a waste, you know? We could have actually gotten another high value product out of it, but not really. I mean, at least it didn't go into the air, or get incinerated, you know? It, it's those materials will have another life as something else. How is that related? Uh, we're, okay, I've drifted. Uh, anything with a finite, so, oh yeah, we're just trying to, re, we're just trying to slow down the diffusion. We're trying to slow down the, uh, the becoming, the trashification of natural resources, trying to mitigate risk. Because anything with a finite probability of happening will happen. And if you integrate this probability over an infinite amount of time, it will happen an infinite amount of time. So what are the odds that this mirror up here will shatter and one of the shards will go through my eye. Finite probability, finite probability. Uh, and if, if I were here an infinite amount of time, it would happen an infinite amount of times. So the goal is to decrease the probability of an accident or chronic exposure to as close to zero as possible, but recognizing that we will never get there. However, uh, what, uh, if, we are, if our goal is to mitigate the risk, then how could we justify saying that today I will not wear my lab coat or gloves or safety glasses? In other words, what is the acceptable number of times to lose an eye? This is a, uh, an incident that I've relayed to you a few uh, times. When I was a graduate student, I was spin coating this really cool conjugated polymer that I can't believe hasn't really been the topic of more developed studies because it's just, it's just really cool. But anyway, because it has all of these nitrogen groups it's, and it's really insoluble, uh, it's only in fact soluble in neat methane sulfonic acid, which is, uh, has a pKa of like uh, mid, mid negatives between negative one and negative six, probably minus four or something. That's the structure, and this was June 2007. Uh, I had met uh, Dina two months before this, um, uh, which is relevant because I almost disfigured myself. It was producing comets in a film, so I was, I was um, syringe filtering this, and syringe filter accidents like the silent killer, right? So I tried to remove particles with a syringe filter and the methane sulfonic acid sprayed everywhere and I got burned in my face, like 30 chicken pox amount of burns, including one that was about a nickel size splotch on my forehead. Thankfully though, the skin on your face turns, it's actually, your face skin is among the hardest skin to form a scar because of the amount of uh, turnover that the skin cells in your face uh, uh, have. I went to the emergency room and the, uh, the EMT was like, uh, are you even in pain? And uh, um, 
but I thought it was, in, I was actually given an option of student health services or the hospital, and if I went to the hospital, I had to go in an ambulance. Uh, what are the lessons that I learned? Never force anything, especially glassware and syringe filters, or a lab coat. I did not have a lab coat on. I had just a polo shirt, and I still have scars on my forearms because those cells don't uh, refresh, don't turn over as fast. Uh, and then for the rest of my time in grad school, I wore like the Gen Chem goggles in lab instead of the safety glasses. And you should wear these as if there's a chance of anything spraying. Bring a change of clothes to lab. I actually borrowed people's clothes to go to the emergency room because I had acid and conjugated polymer all over everything else. And live with the comets in the film. The comet in the film is where you have a chunk of something that kind of creates a comet-like tail in your spin-coated film. So Barry Sharpless, uh, this is another case study. Barry Sharpless won the Nobel Prize for asymmetric uh, hydroxylation, asymmetric oxidation reaction chemistry. He, he works at uh, Scripps Research Institute across from, uh, from Torrey Pines Road from us, but actually has more citations for click chemistry. Um, so if anyone deserved two Nobel Prizes, uh, he'd probably be on the, on the list, but anyway. He recounts his story here about how there was an NMR tube that had like condensed uh, uh, oxygen in it and uh, the NMR tube exploded in his face and actually glass shard went through his eye and he now has a glass eye. There was a, uh, a high profile and really tragic accident at our, uh, at our, our neighboring institution, UCLA, in 2008, where a 23-year-old lab volunteer was performing an experiment in a synthetic organic chemistry lab. She was transferring T-butyl lithium, which is uh, really, really pyrophoric. So uh, if you have it in a, in a, uh, in a syringe and you, and you were so careless as to like eject it through the air, it would be like a, like a flamethrower, like a stream of fire would, uh, would come out of the syringe. And, uh, and some of this uh, material got exposed to the air, more specifically the water vapor in the air, which reacts very exothermically. And there was a beaker of hexanes or, or something in the, uh, in the fume hood, which caught fire, spilled everywhere, spilled all over her. Uh, and um, the lab coat uh, that uh, a lab mate tried to cover her with a lab coat, it was a non-fire resistant lab coat, just a polyester lab coat, which also caught, caught fire. The safety shower was only a few feet away, but no one thought to put her in it. The worker suffered third degree burns over most of her body and she died uh, after three weeks uh, uh, in the intensive care unit. So after five years of litigation, the PI settled for a $10,000 fine in community service. Um, most people would argue that, this, uh, that, uh, that the costs here were not, uh, uh, that justice was not really served here. But is this situation fairly common in academic labs? Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately the way that, that academic labs are, are run, and this isn't the way it should be, but generally safety is not uh, uh, not taken as seriously as it is in uh, in industry. If you want to learn more about this, Chemical and Engineering News published a ten year reflection um, at this uh, site here. It's a really good. Uh, it's a really uh, um, a very sad but important uh, important read for anyone that's working with hazardous materials. So uh, along the lines of misunderstood probabilities, we tend to think, well, this will never happen to me. Um, but we're really predisposed to misunderstanding probabilities because the probability of a particular accident may be small, uh, but the probability of all accidents is certainly not small. These are some of my favorite uh, examples. The probability of lightning striking on a particular day is one in a million. Just say, just say it's one in a million. And lightning struck today. If you project out into the future, what is the most likely day that lightning will strike again. And some people might be tempted to say, um, I don't know, 10 days from now, 100 days from now, uh, half a million days from now. It's actually uh, tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow is the most likely day that lightning will strike again, uh, because in order for lightning to strike next, 
on Tuesday, we have to fulfill the condition that lightning not strike tomorrow. So logically, tomorrow is the day that lightning is going to strike. There are lots of different ways where we misunderstand probabilities, and the birthday paradox is a really good, uh, good example. Imagine a, a room with 23 people. What is the probability that any two people share the same birthday? Not that share your birthday, but that two people share the same birthday. People see this and they say, well, what are the odds that someone else was born on my birthday? Well, one in 365, obviously. But no, it's any other two people. It turns out 50%. 23 people in a room, there's a 50% chance that two people, any two people will share the same birthday. Misunderstood uh, probabilities. This is where I was my own uh, victim. So before we vacationed in, uh, in Malaysia, so uh, the Malaysian part of the island of Borneo, we got vaccines for hepatitis A, tetanus, typhoid, influenza, treatment for malaria, even though I had the sickle cell trait and I'm not going to die from malaria, I got it anyway, just for that one little bit of extra protection. We treated all of our clothes with uh, permethrin to prevent mosquitoes and bugs and stuff. Bought three bottles of the strongest DEET available at REI. Walked in groups in crowded areas and cities. We did all of our mitigation and uh, we were still the victim of robbery and assault. So we didn't prepare for this eventuality. So what happened, if I haven't told you the story before, is my wife was, uh, was dragged uh, through the street by a guy on a motorcycle trying to steal her purse and had, uh, had cuts uh, and bruises basically on her entire, like every uh, joint in her body. So what are the approaches to safety? The first thing we have to ask ourselves is, is the experiment even worth doing? Is any experiment worth doing when we're considering like the fact that our health might be at risk? No. <laughs> uh, personal, tempered by the fact that indeed we can't eliminate risk, we can only mitigate it. Personal protective equipment, engineering controls. This is like if you have something that is at risk of spilling out of the fume hood, then put it in secondary containment. Put your, uh, your waste in secondary containment. Proper procedures. So before working with a new, uh, new or even potentially hazardous uh, material um, or procedure, make sure you know uh, how to do it. Ask people and to know what the first response is in case of an accident. Focus on making good choices, not just compliance with rules set by the lab and by EHS, because the lab and EHS can't look over your shoulder at all times. Plan experiments such as to mini uh, minimize risk. No experiment is more important than your safety. Don't use chloroform or benzene, for example. If dichloromethane methane or toluene work just as well, because the first uh, ones are more toxic and the second ones uh, aren't. Avoid working alone. There's a separate policy on working alone. And this is the, uh, there is like, this is, this is my official approach to the working alone policy. The campus policy is that no one may work alone in the lab if hazardous chemicals are involved. What, what are ha hazardous chemicals? Air sensitive solids and liquids, for example, potassium metal, silane, phosphines, Alkylating agents, for example, methyl triflate, heavy metal containing materials, for example, uh, compounds of merc uh, mercury arsenic, um, pyrophorics, for example, uh, t-butyl lithium, uh, sodium azide, lithium aluminum hydride, and so on. One time when I was a, an undergrad, uh, we, were in, we were doing a lithium aluminum hydride reduction in organic chemistry lab. And, uh, and the trash can caught on fire. And the TA's first response was to open up a container of acetone and almost dump it on the trash fire until an undergrad student said, no, acetone is flammable. Uh, toxic volatiles, for example, phosgene, um, uh, hydrogen cyanide, chlorine gas, fluorine gas. We don't use these things that often, but, uh, or really, 
we've never used several of these things, um, but they, some of these things are in the clean room. They will, you will be exposed to them at some point in your future careers. The reason uh, that uh, no one may work alone if hazardous chemicals are involved is that someone can call, someone needs to be available to call for immediate assistance, and that could be the difference between an injury and a fatality. Uh, make sure you're familiar with the chemical hygiene plans for all of your, uh, all of your materials. Um, and be broadly aware of what other people are doing in the lab because you don't want to be the victim of somebody else's carelessness. Uh, so by uh, UCSD rules, you have to be up to date with your hazard control plan for every material that you use. So who may work alone? No one may work alone if they're working with hazardous chemicals, period. Grad students, postdocs, and visiting scholars are discouraged from working in the lab without someone else, at least someone else in the group in the building. Undergraduates may not work in the lab without someone else from the group in the building and who knows what you are working with. This other person could be anyone, a grad student, postdoc, visiting scholar, uh, me, but preferably someone senior to you. High school students and summer only volunteers may not work unsupervised under any conditions. Personal protective equipment, gloves, safety glasses, fire resistant lab coats are required in the lab at all times. Regular glasses do not count as safety glasses. Use goggles if there's any potential for splashing. The lab coat must be closed. At one point we had an undergrad who liked to leave his coat open like a cape and Anytime he leaned over the hood, like all that junk was just getting on his front and then he was coming home and eating his tomato soup and it would all be contaminated. <laughs> gloves, gloves provide a temporary barrier. So has anyone had the experience of spilling even like ethanol on their gloves and then it burns after a while? Because uh, the barrier properties of your nitrile gloves, uh, you know, it slows it down but you know that ethanol molecule, or hopefully not something worse like benzene, uh, you know you don't uh, you don't you don't want that on your skin. So as soon as you spill something on your glove, the glove gives you enough time to take it off, put it in the hazardous waste, solid waste, and to get a new glove. Everyone should have two lab coats. Laundry service is provided at no charge. If we don't have safety glasses that fit, order some that do. Use neoprene gloves for handling strong acids, bases, or solvents. Use a face shield for procedures that risk splashing. All right. Pro procedures and engineering controls. All solvent bottles and chemicals must be in secondary containment. Flammable solvent uh, cabinets have to be grounded, so electrically grounded, so that sparks don't ignite them. Heavy equipment has to be secured. Glassware under pressure should be coated or taped. Chemicals stored in uh, proper storage groups, and we had, uh, we had uh, slides on that uh, uh, previously. The uh, postdoc appreciation lunch is happening in this room, and they probably want to set up at half past, so we'll finish this uh, quickly. Um, don't uh, clear flammable materials out of fume hoods. Don't recap needles. Don't touch any surface in the lab without gloves. Everything in, the, everything in the lab that's not in a clean area. There's only one clean area, which is the desk in the back of 210, uh, which um, uh, no samples can go there and no, and no, uh, and no food can leave it. Uh, do not use gloves on door handles or wear them in the hallway or bathroom. Actually, this was a contentious issue uh, last time. Use your best judgment here. Um, but definitely do not use your gloves on a, uh, on, in the bathroom. Like sometimes groups will come in using gloves, they'll touch our door handles and stuff. We do not want to be the victim of someone else's carelessness. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's basically an impossible area to regulate. Sorry. Um, don't wear lab coats in the office area or bathrooms and yell at people who you do see wearing lab coats in the bathrooms or office areas. <laughs> um, unless it's like emitting black body radiation at like 2700K. <laughs> okay, response to emergency in case a fire spill on, this, on yourself, use the safety shower, use the safety shower, and so forth. 
Um, this is uh, potentially embarrassing, but on uh, you know, for some people who might have like uh, exhibitionist tendencies, maybe that's that's okay. <laughs> Use a fire extinguisher only if everyone in the lab has been alerted to the fire and someone is calling the fire department. Now, the safety shower thing, I don't mean to joke about it. It's like that's the reason why people don't use it. It's also the reason why people get killed in laboratory fires. So just it, 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 it can save your life. Use the fire extinguisher only if everyone in the area has been alerted to the fire and someone is calling the department at the fire department already. The fire is small and contained to a single area and you're safe from the toxic smoke produced by the fire and you have a means of escape identified. Your instincts tell you that it is safe to use an extinguisher. If you produce or encounter an uncontained fire, pull the alarm and evacuate. Do not try to extinguish it. Our meeting location is across Matthews Lane. Actually, right now that lot is under construction. Let's say the, uh, the engineering quad will be our, our uh, uh, emergency meeting place. Be prepared to meet the fire department to describe where the fire is and what materials are involved. And an earthquake and miscellaneous. If you're inside, stay there. Get under a table and hold onto a sturdy desk or table or stand against an interior wall. The inclination is to just run out the door, but statistically that's when people get crushed by things in an earthquake. Stay clear of exterior walls, glass, heavy furniture, and appliances. Stay clear of heavy furniture except the one that you're that you're sitting under. Cover your head with your hands and arms. Do not run for the exit. And this is uh, really tragic that I even have to put this on here, uh, but we actually had to take active shooter uh, training a couple of years ago. And, uh, and here is the opposite of earthquake. You do evacuate. If you can't evacuate, then you barricade yourself. And if you can't, if you can't barricade yourself, then what the uh, what the safety experts say is that if that is that really you kind of have to try to try to get control of this person and the more people that do it the better chance there is of saving lives okay so we go from really serious to uh, kind of a joke um, so for some reason, safety kind of reminds me of cleanliness, and this, uh, this I took from, um, from Steven Pinker's uh, book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which he took from Desiderius Erasmus, which is a northern humanist scholar um, on civility and children. Um, safety rules remind me of his rules. Don't spit in the bowl when you are washing your hands. Don't put back on your plate where there's been in your mouth. Don't lick your greasy fingers. Wipe them on the bread or wipe them on your coat. This tells you what people were actually doing back then. If, someone, if something purely, purulent falls to the ground, it should be trodden upon, lest it nauseate someone. This is my favorite by far. If you come across something disgusting in the sheet, don't point it out to your companion or hold it up for the other to smell and say, I should like to know how much that stinks. Thank you for your attention.